Lars Marsden, welcome to Apollos Water. Thank you. My pleasure. It's a real joy to have you here today, but before we get into our conversation, are you ready for the Fast Five? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going to do just fine. If you could bring back one thing from when you were a kid, what would it be and why? Goodness. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess my grandmother... And because she was just a, a great person we lived with, yeah. Okay. It's always good. I would probably do something similar if I had that opportunity, those people that we miss so much. Here's the second question. What's the one non-biblical book that has influenced you the most and why? Well, uh, the most... Uh, Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm having trouble thinking, <laughs> thinking <laughs> of uh, one, one book uh, that I give that. Well, what's a few? I, give me a couple of them that well, come to mind. I, I, um, there's, um, I, I'm talking about Jonathan Edwards today, uh, his religious affections is, is, is really a, an important book. Um, and um yeah the, the problem is that as, as a historian i picked up uh bits wonderful things here and there um uh, but it, um i can't think of a, a book that i would just say this was the one that that that, that really changed my life or shaped reshaped my thinking about um about things i'm trying to think of one but i i don't i'm sorry it's okay no that's okay, okay. Uh, how, how about this if that comes back to you just feel free to add it in there okay. how, here's the third question what's your favorite period of history to study and why period of history to study yeah um well actually i i think i'm most interested uh, in, interested in 20th century 21st century things because as a historian i see my role as to try to help understand what's going on today in terms of the historical factors that have have shaped it and 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 particularly uh, a lot of um, evangelical christianity sees itself as shaped by the bible alone but in fact it's shaped by all sorts of cultural assumptions. So my job is to sort that out and try to you know, sort out the, the gold from the dross. Mm. I would very much agree with you on that, talking about culture and how much it influences, but we'll get to that in a, in a moment. Let's, let's go back to the next question. What is the one historical figure outside of the scripture, out of all the figures in scripture, that you would love to grab a cup of coffee with and why? Um, probably uh, Saint Augustine would. I mean, he's he's. Uh, I see him as the sort of the central theologian that uh, that shaped things. I I guess to so answer your question, uh, actually. Um, if you're going to have a cup of coffee or 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 um, other beverage, I think C.S. Lewis would, mm. would be more fun than 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 just about anyone else you could you could <laughs> think of. And that, you know, that spend an hour with C.S. Lewis would be uh, would be amazing. Whereas you know, in Augustine, it would take a while to figure out our, yeah. our differences in in how to communicate. But uh, yeah, I did a, a little book on. Um, about mere Christianity, and and I just loved reading everything that that Lewis had, had has written. What a phenomenal character historically. I mean, both of those men are, but more Lewis is closer to our own time, and I'm still fascinated at how he's crossed so many different genres and periods of time and groups 
there's no other figure that I've seen like him historically, just in my limited knowledge. Yeah. He's just quite phenomenal. Quite phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how about this one? This is the last question. What's the one historical figure you want Christians to learn more about today and why? Well, today, uh, since we're doing this interview, Jonathan Edwards would be a good, <laughs> a good candidate. And uh, he's... Uh, um, he and and I think he has some some wonderful things to to say to all of us and 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 not everything he says is is wonderful but some of the things really are and and I think any Christian can learn from his insights and it happens to be someone that I've learned a lot from and and so I've tried to share those uh, those insights from Edwards and to see what what really translates well uh, for Christians today. And, and uh, as C.S. Lewis has said, uh, every uh, theologian needs a translator. And mm -hmm. I see myself as a translator of Edwards. So I'm writing Edwards for the 21st century in order to say, here's what, here, here's what you can find here in this person that might seem uh, far away and obscure and sometimes off-putting. Well, before we get to the book, let's get a little bit more of your bio. I mean, you're the historian and you record so many other people's biographies, but you've written a lot. Your ministry has expanded, I mean, just extended over the decades. It's been pretty incredible to see just how God has used you and how many books that you've written. But let's get a little bit of your bio. Where'd you grow up? How'd you come to know Jesus? And what led you to become a historian? And I know I'm asking you to summarize yeah. <laughs> several decades right there in just a few moments, which is hard for a historian to do. But no, that's not too hard, actually. Uh, that um, I, uh, I I grew up in, in Middletown, Pennsylvania, which is near Harrisburg. And uh, my father was a uh, had been the pastor there and then he became a, an executive. He was a mission when I was young, very young. He was a mission secretary for the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and so I grew up in an Orthodox Presbyterian uh, situation. I also grew up in a in, in a in a home that was very old, it was built in the in the nineteenth century, and had been a family home for many generations. So, so I was surrounded by history, but the the history. Uh, that I knew best was the, the the history that had shaped the Orthodox Presbyterians leaving uh, the main Presbyterian Church, and so that was part of my uh, atmosphere when I was growing up. And I was we had a Christian school, and that was emphasized as constantly uh, an an issue in in, in sermons. So uh, I was intrigued by that. I was gripped. By it, I, I I think I I had uh, essential faith or commitment uh, as I was as I was growing up, but but I also had a lot of questions, and 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 I went to a secular um, a secular college, Haverford College in Pennsylvania, wonderful place, and so I was confronted by uh, the best of contemporary learning, and and then. Big question in my life is how do you put these two things together? Here, here is uh, classic Christianity that that had been um, you know, at, at cent central in Western culture for a long time, Central American culture for up to a hundred years ago, and then now it's considered to be quaint, out of date, and and there's this whole other. Uh, you know, at that time, I thought very positive, uh, sort of humanist outlook, and and how do I fit those two things together? So that helped shape in you know, my faith journey. I, I went to to Westminster Seminary for a year to to try to work that out, and that was very helpful. Uh, I, I learned from uh, Cornelius Van Til and uh, Edmund Clowney and a number of other wonderful. Uh, professors there and and that gave me a grounding to for a deeper faith uh, and uh, then I went on to graduate school because I was you know in, on this quest to say how does 
the culture and the faith, how do they interact with each other? And how does the faith uh, be shaped by the culture? What's essential and what's peripheral? And um, in the course of that, I, I ran into uh, reading Jonathan Edwards, who was actually uh, revered in, in uh, Maine, American his history at that at time as sort of the greatest Amer uh, early American thinker, and I you know and I thought wow this stuff is great in in kind of illuminating the reform tradition that I was uh, that I was part of so that became one of my anchors in in my faith commitment but uh, my professional work was still going trying to understand uh, where did the way the church is today, today then being in the 1960s, how did it get that way? And at that time, uh, conservative churches were, were still see, seen to be as fundamentalist and, and, and outdated by, by most people in the culture. And so I took on the, the task of how do you understand where fundamentalism came from? What is it? How did it get shaped? What's it doing now? How did it? How has it gotten changed since then? I wrote about fundamentalism, and I wrote about the um, the neo evangelical movement and at Fuller Theological Seminary, uh, and that was a major agenda trying to understand that tradition. And then I went on to um, try to understand the other culture that I was part of, the academic culture. And where does Christianity fit in academic culture? And, and I, I wrote about uh, a book called The Soul of the American University, how Christianity interacted with university education in America, and also uh, a book called Outrageous Idea of Christian Scholarship said Christian scholarship isn't, isn't that outrageous. It's just it, it can be as academically uh, solid as any other kind of scholarship and it ought to be welcomed into the academy rather than uh, simply being uh, suspect. Uh, so those are the main uh, things I've, I've thought about. And then I, I, after after the, the, that, I got into Jonathan Edwards and I've written a good bit about, about him. And as I mentioned, uh, I did a book on C.S. Lewis. Uh, so it's, it's all in, in along that uh, trajectory of trying to see what are the eternal truths that you can find in a very transitory cultural situation and we are very limited sorts of people so so we have to we have to be very careful what we uh, what we take as absolute and and um, but but nonetheless uh, there's enough there to make a real, a real faith commitment. Well, let's then move into your book as you're talking about Edwards. We have George Marsden, An Infinite Fountain of Light, Jonathan Edwards for the 21st century. What made you want to write this book? You've written on Edwards in the past, but what what, what made you write this book specifically? Yeah, uh, well, um, actually, I ended up writing three books on Edwards. I uh, My friend Mark Knoll had asked me to uh, write a, a book, a biography for a series of biographies for Erdman's. I said, I'd do that. Uh, and then uh, a little later, another friend, uh, Harry Stout at Yale, uh, asked me, he said, we need someone to write a big biography of Edwards for his uh, the 300th anniversary of his uh, birth. And that would have been 2003. This was in the 90s. And so I that was too good a thing to pass. Up, so I said, okay, I'll do that. And but I, I'm committed to write for Erdman's too, so I have to write a shorter biography for them. So I wrote the big biography, and I wrote a shorter uh, biography. And uh, then I was asked to uh, after the big biography came out, I was asked to give a series of lectures, the Stone lectures at Princeton Theological Seminary. And so I lectured on. Jonathan Edwards for the 21st century. And that was, uh, what, 17 years ago. Uh, and since then, I've taken parts of those lectures and 
given them various places. So uh, a few years ago, I decided, well, I should put this together in a finished form. So I revised it pretty uh, drastically, but it's still essentially some of the ideas that I, I developed then of saying, on the one hand, here's a biography. On the other hand, here's what uh, what you can take away from it, and 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 the things I think are really important. And uh, yeah, so, so that's that's where the book came from. You start off the book talking about Edwards and its importance of first of all understanding a history and studying history. But one of the things that you take pain to talk about is the fact that. It's very difficult with how we in modern world, the modern world, take our standards of today and then export those back on others' time. Why is it so important to see Edwards in his own time? Well, uh, first of all, you have the, the first thing you need to do when you're going studying it, people in another era is to think what did they take for granted. And what, how is that different than things we take for granted? And, and for instance, we take for granted um, some sort of principle of equality, uh, equal opportunity, and, and so forth. And, and that's applied in all sorts of different and sometimes contentious ways. But it's an ideal that we all hold to. Whereas in most of the history of the world, people have simply assumed that uh, human society is hierarchical. There are some people who are, you know, in in charge, and other people who are subordinate, and and that that was the way God made things. And 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 so, uh, someone like Edwards just automatically sees the world as hierarchical. So that, for instance. Uh, in, in in marriages, men should be uh, in charge, and 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 women are subordinate, and men go go to college and 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 get that kind of education. Women can be educated, but not in formal ways. So so there's some essential. Well, just just say, should should women get educated? That's something. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, today, everyone thinks, of course, they they should. Whereas for him. That was not an obvious kind of, or for any, you know, just, I mean, it, it was not, uh, it was rarely a matter of, of, of much dispute. I mean, I'm sure some women were, dis I mean, I, I know some women were, were disputing, but, but pretty rarely. So it's just a different world. And, and, and you have to take that into account and, and live with it and not say, well, if this person is wrong about that, I can't listen to to, to someone who who had that kind of view of of um, hierarchy, uh, because it's, it's yeah, that's you can't. I mean, the, the general rule, which I, I mentioned in the book, is I can't learn from someone who is wrong about X, Y, or Z. You know, that might be. The greatest thinker on all sorts of other things, I mean, uh, but uh, just because they're wrong on, on 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 one thing, it doesn't mean that you can't they can't be brilliantly right on on something else. And and if, and if the rule was you had to be right about everything, then no one could learn from us either, because we you know we're flawed too, and we have our blind spots, and and people in uh, you know, other future generations will probably think back. Well, the 21st century people were sure stupid about this, um, whatever. Uh, so, so anyway, so the, the idea is uh, you, you don't dismiss someone just because they're wrong about something or other. You wrote, and in, in taking that thought into consideration, you wrote this. In studying the Christian past, I have found Jonathan Edwards especially helpful both in challenging assumptions of our own age and in offering invigorating guidance in my own quest to follow Christ. What are some of the assumptions of our day that help Edwards helps us to see? Yes. Well, um, I developed that as, as, as a, one of the central themes in the book, 
And I get it that by comparing the legacy of Jonathan Edwards to that of Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was born two years after Edwards in New England in a Calvinist family, very similar background. But Benjamin Franklin went in the direction of the enlightenment of that time uh, of more uh, secular kinds of ideas of a, a broader kind of uh, he was he, he believed there had to be a providence of some sort of God, but not following the Bible particularly. And <clears throat> Franklin became one of the progenitors of the American way of life, the self-made man uh, at that time self a person, as we would say, uh, the uh, and a champion of technology. Yeah, he was a great. In, in, in uh, practical practical science shaping the American enterprise and, and shaping the Ameri the the, uh, the early government uh, and Declaration of Independence. Um, so uh, Franklin shaped the helped shape the modern world, and the modern world is uh, a, a uh, our underlying assumptions tend to be that essentially the real world is the material world. And technology increases that kind of sensibility because if we want to solve a problem, there's a technological way to get it done. You just look up on your phone or your computer and if you can get through on it, uh, you can figure out you can figure out most anything, but it's a, a technical a technical issue. And and so uh the, as lots of people have, have observed, we, we have a very materialistic kind of world or uh, what Jacques Alou called a technological society uh, mm -hmm. where we, we tend to think of things in, ter in terms of technique. And so we uh, you know, look at people as how can we use these people to shape our, our enterprise and, and uh, it, it becomes a matter of calculation. Uh, Edwards on the other hand, starts with and and continues with God as the creator and the sustainer of reality, that uh, the, the real world is the world that uh, was created by the creative love of God. Uh, and it's essential, you know, God sustains the world so uh the heavens declare the glory of god it, the, the the universe is god's language so it has a uh it, creation is not something that simply happened back that way back when and then god wound it up and let it go uh creation is an ongoing kind of thing your language is something that's continuing so there's an essential uh living character to reality it's related somehow to god's sustaining it and 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 god is in in sometimes very mysterious ways revealing revealing his love and and the central uh, revelation is the love of god in christ that uh, we might the, the 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 goodness of the universe is obscured by suffering but this is a suffering god this is a god who knows our suffering knows our is acquainted with sorrow and grief and uh that's what you should see uh in the reality around you that's your uh, should be part of your consciousness uh when you look out at the the beauty of uh you know of the you know the trees around you, or or uh, whatever uh, you see. Edward saw it as these are glimpses of uh, the divine light of the beauty of God that that you can see. Uh, you 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 cultivate a, a kind of consciousness of Christ being uh, part of reality, and 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 that I, th I think uh, you know it's a difficult kind of sensibility but it's a very helpful sensibility to counter uh the idea that everything's technological everything the you know, material world is the real is 
is is the real world and to think of oneself as in this uh universe that where where god is um not just a sort of a abstract principle not someone who just worked long ago and did you know creation and then revealed christ but this is an ongoing kind of enterprise that the god is uh there and so I find Edwards helpful in trying to to cultivate that sensibility. I, now I find I don't know that I always I don't I know I don't always succeed in that, but but that's uh, that to me is 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 a wonderful uh, vision to, to to try to to have, and 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 you, you can you know it's, it's something that can be uh, renewed from the, from day to day. You write about creation and you refer to that, but you also refer to something that I think many Christians have a hard time seeing and understanding when you talk about the beauty of God and his response to the beauty of God, it was just awaking this idea of transcendence. And you've mentioned also, and you've alluded to it already, is how technology has distracted us or distanced us from God. You've already alluded to that, where we've lacked an understanding of the transcendent, and yet he awakens that within us in this beauty of God to see it. Taking that into consideration just for a brief moment, he saw the beauty of God. It caused him to long for God, but he also said that there was a response that you talk about in the middle of this. I mean, you talk about language, but you also talk about how he responded to the beauty of God, which I, I, I'd never read about before. You actually say that he responded to the beauty of God with singing. Oh, yeah. Which I, yeah, which yeah. I thought was very interesting. I, I'd never thought of that before. And then you actually kind of develop a little bit of a case for how they understood worship in the latter part of the 18th or in the 18th century, in the mid 18th century, and how they didn't have oftentimes music, but it was very unusual for churches to actually sing harmonies. Yeah. So yeah, can they, you describe yeah, they, a little bit that to us? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, first of all, the 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 the, the basic thing is that uh, Edward saw this response to God, and he'd go out in the fields and 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 contemplate God and Christ, and and look for sort of signs of what he called sign. He kept a notebook of signs of divine things, but but then one kind of response would be just to be singing because. Uh, in classic Christianity, the, the creation of the world is, is often uh, represented as uh, like a symphony that, that, that God is uh, bringing is the harmonies of, um, of, of God's goodness that, that can be seen uh, in, in, in reality if we have the eyes to, to see it. Anyway, so and Edwards loved singing, it's, he and his wife. Uh, sang together, and in New England churches, um, the singing had been dreadful uh, originally because the Puritans were very strict on the idea of the Bible alone. If the Bible didn't prescribe something, they didn't think there should, it, it should happen. So they sang only the Psalms, and they didn't have musical instruments. For the first hundred years of the Puritan settlements in New England, they 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 just had someone would, uh, a leader would start the song and then people would just sort of sing away uh, without any any tunefulness. And, and apparently it was, it was really awful. Uh, anyway, Edwards was part of a movement to at least introduce four-part harmony. They still didn't have musical instruments, but they had four-part harmony. And if you've ever been to a, a Church of Christ uh, gathering, they they don't have musical instruments, but they have wonderful singing with the the, the harmonies that the the a cappella singing can have. So Edwards promoted that in his in, in his congregation as a way of of getting some spiritual intensity into the into the singing uh, in the worship. And of course, uh, you know, since then we've we've run with that sometimes well and sometimes. Not so well, but and anyway, his music was very important to him because he saw uh, that as as uh, a way of 
seeing the harmonies uh, of, of of goodness of of uh, of proper relationships that, that proper love is proper relationships and proper music is 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 a right is is right relationships and 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 he he also thought he 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 observes that um in heaven the, the music will be way better than anything we can imagine because we're limited by uh, he said the gross harmonies of, of or, or the, the harmonies limited to our gross air that, that there's only a certain number of notes that we can do whereas if you have an infinite, infinite number of notes you can have infinite kinds of music I don't know about uh, it, but it's, it's an interesting thought but, but it does reflect how music and harmonies was is, is a way of thinking about what is what are proper love relationships? Why, how, how should that work? I, I particularly really enjoyed that part. I I come from a singing background, so this idea and being and having been in churches of Christ where they don't have that, and but also seeing some of those services that you said, there's some beautiful four part harmonies, but there's also some disasters. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, and I'm just imagining uh, yeah. Jonathan Edwards Church where you have sister. I mean, Brother Ichabod give up to do a special or something along that line. I want yeah. to know what that's going to be like. Um, yeah, no, no it, it, I mean, he was he was working on it, and uh, I don't know. I mean, we don't know, of course, exactly how that will they uh, succeeded. But and then and then I I bring in that he was contemporary of J.S. Bach, and mm. you know, there you see a musical, you know, where where, where the musical idea of praising God with, with 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 wonderful harmonies is 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 developed so 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 wonderfully but uh, New England didn't have that uh, that blessing you take time to introduce a lot of these contemporaries as you've already alluded to you have Benjamin Franklin who's the really ultimate pragmatist the ultimate self-made man the inventor then you you also though bring in Bach you bring in the musical part that he would have been somewhat I think familiar with Bach's music in some way, shape, or form, you also bring in George Whitfield. What was your point of bringing in George Whitfield into the conversation? He's another self-made man, uh, 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 contemporary of, of, of younger contemporary of Edwards and Franklin, and uh, Whitfield is is really the inventor of modern evangelicalism that. Um, Developing a, a revival uh, conversionist version of Christianity that's not uh, to church organizations particularly, but rather is uh, developed uh, in and through churches or around churches or beside churches. Uh, so Whit Whitfield... He'd preach in any church that would let him preach. If they didn't let him preach, he'd preach out in the fields. And, and it turned out preaching in the fields was even more popular. So he'd sometimes have uh, audiences of many thousand people that would gather to hear him preach. But he, he was the first um, celebrity evangelist. And and he, he, uh, he was very traditional Orthodox Reformed in his in his theology, but his his methodology invited uh, the the what, what's become uh, characteristic of a lot of evangelicalism that the the star the the, the celebrity the the, you know, the person who can uh, draw a big crowd tends to to shape the movement and and uh, not all of them are as orthodox as. As, as 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 Whitfield, so you you, you get eventually a kind of uh, theological. Well, I, 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 mean, I think anarchy is not too strong a word to say that that that's a lot of good and a lot of mixed up with a lot of other things. But the the marvelous thing is, three hundred years later, there's still a recognizable evangelical message that gets through the core message survives but it's a market driven kind of religion and uh the people who 
you know, find out how to make churches grow better, how to have more popular music, uh, more popular uh, preaching, more, you know, and sometimes more pop, you know, more popular promises of what what people are going to get out of it. Uh, that's all mixed in with 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 the gospel message, and 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 I see Whitfield as a progenitor of that, and then uh, that's in contrast to Edwards, who was very consciously trying to to keep the the message anchored in the church and in. In in the best thinking and you know in, in sort of the uh, as as C.S. Lewis would, would would say the the Christian truths that have that have survived through 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 the ages and and can be found by by looking at the best theologians. So Edwards is is seeing the job of the pastor as to uh, be trained well and then to to present that you know present that well and he was all for the revival but with boundaries and 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 Whitfield tended to play fast and loose with the with the boundaries which had which uh was wonderful in some ways that uh, American religion particularly uh, has been very strong at the grassroots and that's because of the strength of the of, of the evangelical tradition that if you have a a popular sort of religion, it, it can take deep root, but it's also uh, populist in in the sense that uh, sometimes it picks up ideas and uh, that that are very, you know, very popular but not particularly Christian, and and weds them to uh, to the Christian tradition. So I see Whitfield as uh, progenitor of the characteristic American style of religion. And I think Edwards is 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 helpful in uh saying slow down and 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 let's think about uh where the real center of this ought to be and and, and not get carried away by uh, by popular fads. Speaking of popular fads, and you mentioned how oftentimes it's rooted in this populism that takes place. We've seen a real shift and and you've i'm sure you've seen this over time a shift within christianity over the last few years you've seen this uh decrease rapidly of evangelical christianity almost every denomination has reported massive losses we've seen christian universities close we've seen all of these different pieces starting to happen and everyone's asking different questions on why and in the middle of all this you have edwards who's talking about rightly ordered loves between authentic Christianity and what is really the hypocrisy. And, and in some respect, you're seeing a pruning in the American church right now where the cultural Christianity is beginning to fade and you're finding out the reality of what really is there. However, as you already alluded to, we have our culture that influences us much more than we realize, especially in regards to the Christian faith. So we've seen a, a uniting of the political sphere. We've seen this cultural Christianity, but it's still more, in some respect, that moral therapeutic deism that's there, the, the mm -hmm. whole vestige of, of uh, American evangelicalism that is uh, cultural has not completely subsided as of yet, and it will be some time. However, as we go about this exercise, as we go about evaluating it, can, a, a history happening around us, how does Edwards act as a clarifier in helping us to really identify the authentic nature of Christianity as we observe what's going on in our in our culture today? Yeah, uh, he he doesn't answer uh, all the questions. I mean, he's he's, but he does uh, <clears throat> address the question that was raised already in, in the Great Awakening when Whitfield had come through, and he was a great supporter of Whitfield. Uh, but then there are other evangelists who were imitators who were already uh, way off off the track. And and he saw uh, a lot of people, some of in his own congregation, who whom he thought had been converted, and then 10 years later, obviously hadn't happened. And you know, but they you know they were professing Christians and 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 uh, communicant members and 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 so he he 
in in the wake of the revivals, he asked, "What is what are the signs of authentic Christianity that we can look for, particularly in ourselves, but also in others?" And and he writes a, a book on fetus and religious affections or religious loves, and the signs of true Christianity are where are your loves oriented, and, and I think of it as uh, if if you have this central vision of Christ, the revelation of Christ at the center of reality, that's what creation is, why, why, God, why God created it, uh, or the, that to reveal the love of, of Christ, then that ought to be a, a kind of, uh, like a planet that hold, hold, holds your other loves, your lesser loves in, or like the sun that holds you, the, the planets of your lesser loves in their right order, the right, right ordering of loves, which comes from Augustine, uh, that, that uh, what does it look like if a Christian's loves are rightly ordered? So he starts with love to God and uh, expounds on uh, what that in, involves. And then he gets to what are the qualities of a Christian person who's truly loving and uh, humility uh, is, is he, he, he quotes Augustine and, and, and John Calvin saying, uh, what are the essential traits of Christianity? And he says, humility, humility, humility. It's like the builder's location, location, location. Mm -hmm. uh, humility, humility, humility. That's, that should be one of our, our, our central, uh, our, our central traits and and one that I, I i found particularly uh intriguing in light of a lot of discussion today is he he emphasizes that the true christian should have a, a lamb like dove like character like like jesus and 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 rather than emphasize he, he says there's some christians think that you need to be manly warlike but they're you know they're they're really mistaken and in, in, in sort of translating that, those kinds of fierce qualities into the Christian character and, and what you should be looking for in the Christian character are childlike characteristics. And, you know, except, you know, if you, you have to be like a little child to, to follow Christ and, and, and Christ is gentle and, and mild. And, and we lose sight of that uh, all too easily. And then Edwards goes on with other uh, traits, ends up, longest part of his treatise is charity look for acts of charity what what are people doing for for other people and that that's that's really the best the best sign how how much of your christianity is self-serving and how much is really serving others and it can be very a challenging thing to keep thinking about you know how you, you know, how how much of what you're doing is is to uh, to make yourself secure and comfortable, and 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 are you really uh, reflecting the love of Christ and, and and sacrificial love of Christ? That's a great challenge and and a you know, very difficult kind of thing. But I think that's Edwards is right. That's the kind of thing to 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 look for, and that's the sort of thing that can give depth to anyone's. Christianity. I, I don't have a good idea of how to solve the problems of all the problems of the church today, but th but those are good qualities. And you mentioned uh, like uh, moralistic, therapeutic deism. Well, yeah, yeah, that it's therapeutic. Yeah, a lot of people see Christianity as just sort of therapeutic. What what do I get out of it? And 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 Edwards is saying it needs to be oriented toward these loves first, to love to God, and then this. This rightly ordered secondary loves and and, and get them in the right uh, in in the right re relationships and then then there will be beauty in your own your own Christianity and and I think one one goal for any local congregation is to say I mean, is is that people are drawn to Christianity often not by particular teachings or by arguments, but they say, look at those people and there's something they're doing that's that's just right. And I'd like to be I'd like to be part of a, a community 
like that. And, and that can, the, the, that's much more important than do you teach this doctrine or, or, or this particular doctrine, uh, but, but to, de to, to develop a community that's, that's known as, as a loving community. And that's the way people are, are very often convinced, convinced of things. I mean, that's, that's the way we, you know, we, we try to witness them. You, you, you try to be a, a winsome, a winsome community. And, and, and I think sometimes that gets lost, particularly in, in some of the, um, you know, on both the left and the right, or political Christianity, or you, you, you get, you know, ideological, um, ideological Christianity rather than, um, what shall I say, relational Christianity that's biblically grounded. And, and that's what Edwards one of the things Edwards, I think, offers a, a guide to. I mean, he doesn't have all the answers, but it's 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 a good reminder that this is this is where the core the core should be, and this is this is what a Christian and a Christian community should look like. As we we mean we talk about Edwards, and Edwards is this is kind of an interesting figure to speak to our current historical moment. As you've been serving for many, many decades, I mean, your ministry, you were, you were in your early, mid eighties. Is that right? Yep. Mid eighties, mid eighties. What are the changes that you've seen over time in how we express our evangelical faith that you think Edwards really speaks to? It, 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 when I was growing up in, in the 1950s, evangelicalism was um well it was sort of two things one was that billy graham and and people who who liked him and, you know who liked billy graham and for a long time uh that i th thought i think was a, a good definition of an evangelical someone who likes billy graham then there were also fundamentalists who were in various ways more conservative uh and more separatist, who was often suspicious of of Billy Graham, and sort of it was it was a fundamentalist wing and the evangelical broader wing, and that distinction is, has has um, fallen apart to some extent, partly because um, in the twentieth century people have stopped calling themselves fundamentalists ever since nine eleven and the use of it for Islamic fundament has is not the best term, but that's what people said. Islamic fundamentalists, uh, Christian fundamentalists have, have stopped using the term. So it's a little harder to identify, but it's also uh, what's happened is uh, a lot of the um, political religion has become intermixed with the uh, with with various Christian traditions and 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 churches become identified with where they stand on the political issues uh, in a way that um, just wasn't wasn't nearly as prominent um, sixty years ago that uh, churches people in churches had you know largely conservative political. Views, but but they weren't seen as a, an arm of of anybody's politics either on the left or or the right and 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 I think th that that creates a, a real tension and uh, that that cuts across all the religious uh, traditions that you can you know find it among Catholics or Protestants or any subgroup of Protestants that, that you look at they're uh, they're not only divided from uh, other denominations but they're divided often among themselves and and often it's uh, the you know, the political divisions that become more important so i think one thing that edwards is helpful for is to to get away from that and, and to look for the, the the more perennial christian virtues and and that's why i i in the book i invoke uh, c.s lewis often to, to you know try to get mere christianity that you know, Edwards fleshes out some depth in what in what that means, but but the but the idea that you're you're looking for the essence of the Christian tradition and don't get caught up in 
in in in, in some sort of uh, sub movement that that subverts that as you know, that 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 can look like you're doing the right thing, but then you're actually subverting the es essence or alienating a, a lot of people you shouldn't be alienating. As we look forward in the next 20, 30 years, I mean, and again, I I know that we never can be, uh, historians don't like to be prophets per se, but what do you see as the biggest challenges for Christianity moving forward in the next 50 or even century? I know it's hard to predict that, but what do you see right now on the horizon are the biggest challenges or obstacles? Well, um, one thing that... Um... I tend to do, and I think a lot of people tend to do, is you, you think of Christianity in terms of, and particularly evangelicalism, in terms of its American manifestations. If you if you switch your basic orientation to world Christianity, then you have a, 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 a very different picture, one that I'm not especially expert on, but... Um, but the center of gravity moves away from the Western world, from the former Christendom, to uh, places where Christ Christianity has been growing <clears throat> of all sorts. Have been growing amazingly, and then, yeah, you know that's what's happened in the last seventy years. That's what's happened. That uh, you know, in in 1950, you didn't have, you know, world Christianity was you know there you know were, were missions that that were you know, had had established beachheads maybe, but not you know, and 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 then it's just taken off in a way that I don't think anyone predicted. So I I expect I don't in the next generation one of the big challenges is to say <clears throat> how does Christianity in the Western world relate to Christianity in the in in the uh, or majority world, and I know you do a lot of thinking about that, and you probably know more about that than I do. But uh, that that seems to me to be, uh, you know, it, it's, it can also be a, a source of a strength to say this is not a. I mean, you look at the American situation, say church memberships declining and 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 the like. But if you look at the world Christianity, it's uh, all, overall it's it's flourishing. So. Uh, how do we relate to that, and and what should that what should that teach us? And and that's um, for the next generation of historians to figure out. Uh, beyond, <laughs> beyond my pay grade. <laughs> Looking at the global nature of Christianity that you've just already highlighted for us, and the the rise of non Western Christianity is Andrew Walls has brought to our attention Philip Jenkins many of these world christian scholars but yet knowing knowing how you have been really the probably the greatest historian on on the establishment or the focus on the shift between fundamentalism and american evangelicalism in the 20th late 19th and early 20th century that gives you a very interesting viewpoint that most people do not have uh, of the world what role do you see Western Christianity playing, if any, as Christianity continues to move forward and it continues to expand around the world? Well, Western Christianity has uh, very rich resources to draw on from the sort of the grand Christian tradition, and it, 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 and and I. My impression is that a lot of world Christianity tends, <clears throat> I mean, it, it, it tends to be more um, more Whitfield than it is Edwards. And, and, and I mean, it's wonderful grassroots growth, but it's but it's um, not always, you know, under un, under you know, control. And 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 I think I think there's there's a big it's very important for the church in general, and this is West or East, to recognize the need for theologians and scholars who are standing back, uh, that that's 
in in the parts of the body of Christ, that's not the most important part, but it's 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 one of the parts that you need in in you know in in the in the in in the human body. You need to uh, take your time and think it think it through. And so I think in Paul's analogy to the the parts of the body of the church, you need a part of the body. You know, like in the Catholic Church, they manage the magisterium. They, that uh, so you need school. You need like theological education, and 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 I think that can be. Uh, you know, the West can can help that in in that because they have a long tradition of that. And I, and I know in I mean in in Edward's studies, the Yale Center for um, whatever it's called, a study of. Jonathan Edwards Center puts all the works of Jonathan Edwards online, and they have a. There are Jonathan Edwards centers around the world. There's about a dozen centers, I think, and and they get all sorts of hits on on you know people looking you know using Edwards around around the world, and and so that's I mean that's uh, taking you know the yeah, and and that's probably true of lots of other great theologians uh, the, the the west does have that to, to 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 offer as part of what the universal church should should be like and and to keep it from being simply wild wildfire kind of growth um so and anyway that's you know that, that's that's i mean I've, that, i think that's one of the things that's that's needed and i'm not an expert enough to say what else is we need to do you've also as we've we've talked a lot about edwards but you've also alluded to c.s lewis playing a role in how the christian faith is i mean moving forward in this mere christian idea what role do you think lewis or what do you think lewis has to say to us at this cultural moment well i think that the, the advantage of lewis is because it's mere christianity it's can appeal to people in almost any Christian tradition. That's, and that's why Lewis's works have been so um, influential. And I, I think Lewis can bring us together. If, 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 you, if you say we stand for, I mean, if, if you're starting, uh, well, like I have friends who, who work in Christian study centers at universities, if you say we represent mere Christianity, that's going to to be a, a opening to bring people together rather than to divide them. Where if you say we we stand for the you know legitimate reformed super Baptist Methodist group, then then people don't know what you know, you, 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 you 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 divide if you if if you get too much into in, into the particulars of your, your 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 own little insights into 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 things. So mere Christianity is, it seems to me, a, a, a real goal to to work on cultivating and to say, you know, those people differ from us in, in some ways, but on the basics of mere Christianity, we can you know, we can join with them and work with them, and and uh, I think that. You know, outsiders will find that more attractive as well. In the 20th century, who do you think, besides Billy Graham, has played such a massive role in the shape of Christianity going forward, good or bad? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I've been talking about C.S. Lewis would be a, a, a oh yeah. Good, uh, I mean, in, in American Christianity, the uh, like Jerry Falwell is 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 obviously a very big influence. I'm not going to say. Good or bad, I get it. <laughs> but it's a big, in, you know, the big influence and 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 changed changed the direction. I think of a lot of a uh, lot of Christianity from being more churchly to being more political and 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 cultural. Uh, and uh, well, yeah, the the uh, I mean before Billy. Graham was really Sunday. We we were a great evangelist, or uh, R. A. Tory. Uh, 
you know, help found the fundamentalist movement. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not. I'm, I'm no, no, not, no. I, I, very, I think very. That was just just an that. aside. Again, that's just an aside. Probably won't make that one to the okay, to good. the to the <laughs> publication there. I I just was curious. Um, what's a what's a good water bottle? for our people as we wrap up our time together today what's a good water bottle for our our audience our listeners out there for them to sip on to be spiritually nourished by this week well is it to get back to the core of of edwards that the idea that the very reason God created the universe is to reveal the love of Christ. And and I've put it as the universe is a product of the big bang of God's love. If you think of that as at the center all reality and, and in some way radiating in reality and even though it's obscured by sin and darkness and all sorts of other things that for whatever reasons God has permitted, Nonetheless, the revelation of Christ who suffered to share our pains and to, and to forgive our sins and uh, bring salvation, that's, that's what reality is, is about. And that, that can be found in reality. And you can see it if you step outside and, and, and look at the beauty around you. You can have that, you can cultivate that sensibility and this sensibility of seeing the beauty of the love of another person that Edwards puts it in terms of uh, when you see a, a, a beautiful person and you fall in love you can't help it mm -hmm. and and if you get a glimpse of the, the love of God the beauty of God you can't help it that that that's um, you know that's a way of explaining the Sovereignty of God, how God's sovereignty relates to my free will. Uh, when you fall in love, it's all you, but you can't help. Uh, it's free will, but you can't. But you can't help it, and and you appreciate the love of another person. That you respond to the love of another person. That's what Christianity is essentially about. It's a personal kind of thing. We have a personal universe rather than an impersonal universe. That is a marvelous thought to end our time on today. I, I want to thank you for writing the book and all of the books that you've written. They have been such a treasure for Christians for the last, I mean, decades that are going to nourish many for the years to come. I want to thank you specifically for writing this book on Edwards for us today. And I also want to thank you for coming on Apollos Watered. Okay, my pleasure. And, and it's been fun. Thank you.